Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. What you're about to listen to is a one-part solo episode where I develop an original, I think original, theory about two different types of democratic culture that can arise, which I call congressional and parliamentary culture. So not institutions, but ways of thinking about politics that politicians and voters operate within. I'd be incredibly interested in your feedback on this. The only other time I've done something like this, where I'm not giving you either an interview or analysis of people's views, was the episode on humiliation. So I've developed an original account, and again, this is a really weird way of doing political theory, right? Where I just talk into a microphone and people send me emails. But it's been incredibly valuable for me to do, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of the people who do engage with it. In terms of what's coming up on the podcast, I haven't forgotten about interviews, by the way, for people who tend to like them more, and I do have some quite interesting people scheduled to come on. We have just had a few difficulties with, like, people's calendars and so on, so I've done a bit of a stretch of solo episodes, which I've very much enjoyed, but I do just want to say it's not going to be only solo episodes. I also apologise that the schedule hasn't been quite consistent recently. I've been aiming to get one out a week, which I usually have, but um, not on the same day. So I do not understand that people appreciate having a regular time for their podcasts to come out so that they can fit it into their schedules. I've had, well, I'm not going to go into like my personal life and work and whatever, but I've sort of been rearranging the various sort of um, uh, duties and obligations and things that I'm doing in my life. um, And I'm going to be traveling a bit, so it has sort of jarred with the podcast a little bit, and these are, you know, I know like, oh, you sit and you talk into a microphone for an hour, it might not sound like a huge amount of work, but like, I do tend to write scripts for these things. I have um, in front of me right now for this one, um, just a sort of um, bound notebook filled with scribbles of just this absolutely incomprehensible stuff to like pull together my thoughts for, for this episode. Um, And you've got to do several takes often to get something that doesn't sound like trash. So just finding the time to get these done. um, I've been doing it, but not in a way that ensures a regular schedule. So I do apologize for that. Seriously, I know people like to have them come out on a certain day, and I am aiming to get back to that. But on that note, there may well not be next one one next week. The reason for that, I know what I want to do is I got, for the um, economic inequality episode, I got so many great emails and so many comments. I'm literally just going to take an episode where I answer them because there's like, there's like some really quality stuff in there and it's clearly something that engaged people. So I got a bunch of follow-up questions and comments I'm going to take on. Um, I am traveling around a lot over the next week and a half. So I'm going to see if I can find time to record and if I'll have equipment to record during that time. But if it's the choice between doing something that's rushed and low quality and not doing something at all, um, I'm probably going to opt for not doing something at all. So I do just want to flag that. And again, I apologize for that. Um, if you're a Patreon supporter, obviously you won't get billed for that week. And, you know, I mean, hey, maybe that's good news for you, right? Like, like the amount you give to the podcast will come down a little um, for next month. But that's sort of what's going on with the schedule right now. And if you do have sort of thoughts or comments about like the overall structure of the podcast, like how often you would want it to come out, what day you would want it to come out, what you like and don't like about it, please do tweet at me or email me, you know, whatever, um, and give me feedback as I try to sort of plan out what I'm doing with this. And just on that note, again, as always, um, this really is only possible because I get the support of viewers. So I'm incredibly grateful for all of my Patreon supporters, as well as just to people who, you know, share it on social media and uh, stuff like that. So that's a little bit of housekeeping. Let's get straight to this. This is me developing an original account of what's going on in British and American politics, and I would love your feedback on it. (laughs) 
being a Brit who's lived in America for near enough a decade now is people often want to know when they first meet me. They go, so it's like England different from America? And, you know, in 10 years, I've not really worked out how to answer that question because it's like, I sometimes just say, well, in some ways it's different, in some ways it's quite similar and leave it at that. A a less polite way of answering it would be to say, well, you know, could you give me a bit more specificity? Because at the risk of sounding rude, if you ask a silly question, you are going to get a silly answer. Like, you know, what particular aspect are we thinking about here? So a more specific question, which I've also got a lot having worked, I mean, way back in the day, but having worked in British politics and having worked quite a bit in American politics is like, so British politics is different, right? And the answer, you know, that's an interesting thing to talk about and then we can get get specific. So the things Americans have in their head when they think about British politics is one, one which is true and one which isn't. The one which is true is they tend to have this idea that British politics isn't as rabidly right-wing you know, our conservatives aren't quite as quote-unquote crazy as American conservatives, at least until Brexit happened, and I'll get to that. And that's kind of true. I discussed this on my audience questions episode, but overall, I think British conservatives, European conservatives in general, aren't quite as radical as the contemporary American Republican Party. There's different ways of looking at that question, but I do think that's probably largely true. The, The one that's false, and I get a chuckle out of it every time, is, um, American have this ridiculous view that British people are, like, smart and sophisticated. And they're like, oh, but, you know, our politics are so stupid, and you you guys are so sophisticated over there. This weird kind of, like... For people who can be very arrogant in a lot of ways, Americans have this weird and unwarranted sort of, like, humility and deference about these sorts of things. And I I find it a bit cringy at times, because it's like... You know, have you seen Newcastle City Centre when the bars close? (laughs) Sophisticated is the very last word that you could think of to describe that. And even in political culture, I mean, my God, have you seen the right-wing tabloids? They, They make Fox News look positively rarefied. So that's sort of what Americans have in their head. But then they're also quite shocked to learn just how different British political institutions are. So, for instance, a lot of the things that seem axiomatic to Americans thinking about politics simply aren't there in British institutions. So the idea of all of these different checks and balances that Americans have really aren't there in British politics. We elect a parliament, the parliament legislates, and people are like, what if the parliament does something bad? And it's like, then we vote them out, I guess. And that's so alien to the American mind. There's no judicial oversight. There isn't really... I mean, there is an upper chamber, but it can be overridden. So it's really just one body. There's not an independently elected executive. It's just Parliament. And Parliament, I mean, this is a thing that's become a thing with Brexit, but Parliament is theoretically sovereign. That's really weird to Americans. That there's not, I mean, there kind of is, but nowhere near to the degree that there is in America. There's not a clear separation of powers. There's not a clear executive legislative division. Or even a judicial division. There's no written constitution. It's just convention. There's no higher law. There's no sort of bit that you can appeal to. It's just something that's been built up over time by custom and tradition and ancient decrees. It's not written down in any one place. And that is completely alien to the American way of looking at things. So when I try to explain the functioning or lack thereof of the British Constitution, I think Americans can find it quite shocking. Now, in the past few years, that's all changed, however. And as opposed to being asked about difference, I've been asked about similarity. Is Brexit and Trump 
the same sort of thing. You know, granting the the institutional arrangements are very, very different, and the, the political centre of gravity, if you want to call it that, is different. Isn't it true that we're kind of looking at the same thing? In other words, a sort of right-wing, anti-immigrant, quote-unquote populist backlash against sort of quote-unquote liberal elites. Aren't we looking at that same species of beast arising in different ways and within very different institutional systems, but aren't these kind of the same thing happening in both places? Now, I've been quite cautious of this narrative, and I apologise if I've ever fed into it, because there are times, you know, we've discussed populism on the show a lot, we've discussed problems that liberal democracy might be having in the current age, and contradictions inherent within the system that are now becoming manifest, and I have sometimes put Brexit and Trump in the same sentence in a way that implies that I think they're the same thing, and I don't. And I've always been a bit cautious of that narrative, that we're looking at a similar phenomenon arising within different systems. And over the past, I think it's actually been over the past year or so where I've been really closely following Brexit and, you know, We've had people on the show to discuss it and try and do some theoretical analysis of it. And the same thing with American politics. I've sort of been developing a thesis that tries to think about what's happening not so much within the institutions of our politics, but the culture of our politics. How people, both you know, voters and politicians, th- conceptualise politics and they think about what's going on. And... Here's the punchline, is not only are Brexit and, you know, what's happening in American democracy not the same thing, they're actually the exact inversion of each other. On a number of quite specific points, particularly when it comes to political culture, they're the exact opposite of each other. And in a way that's actually quite spooky, and in a way that seems to be a little bit more than coincidence. Now, before I present to you my theory, I'll do two quick caveats. The first is, I'm sort of treading on thin ice here. There's only one other time in the show I've brought to you an, a sort of original or quasi-original theoretical framework that I've developed, and that was on uh, political the, the theory of political humiliation that I tried to develop. With that, even that was a little arrogant of me because I'm not an academic. I'm someone who's worked in applied politics and campaigning and a few other things. Um, but that I felt on somewhat confident ground because I really knew the academic literature on freedom and neo-republicanism and so on. I felt confident having an opinion within that space. What I'm about to bring you is a theory about comparative institutional politics, which is something that I haven't touched since my BA, which was 12 years ago now, something like that. Um, And I'm sure there is some academic literature out there on this that I'm missing. And so I want to give that proviso of, like, I do recognise I'm, like, probably entering a debate with insufficient qualifications. On the flip side of that, I don't want to be overly modest and pretend I know nothing. You know, I have spent a long time working in both the UK and the US system. I've done this podcast, which has forced me to read all sorts of different people's books and papers and interview them. And I, you know, I follow, I spend hours every day just consuming news media and podcasts and articles about this stuff. So I I sort of want to land on a middle ground on the sort of humility versus arrogance and like epistemically where I'm at with, with this, which is I don't think it's crazy for me to venture an opinion out there, but I offer it as a tentative thesis rather than a definite conclusion. It's a set of ideas that await contrary evidence and argument. And I really do welcome that, by the way. If there's something in the literature that I'm missing or a set of facts that I'm missing, please do tweet at me or email me or whatever. So that's that's the first proviso. The second proviso is I'm developing this at a very specific point in time. The point in time at which 
it looks like the impeachment inquiry against Trump is picking up steam, but it hasn't happened yet, and, like, you know, I don't pretend to know. Like, the consensus view is that he'll be impeached in the House and acquitted in the Senate. I've no reason to doubt that that's probably the most likely outcome. But on the tail ends of the distribution, I don't think it's implausible that the wheels could fall off and the whole thing just stalls. And on the other end, I don't, you know, it's probably unlikely, but I don't think we should rule out as totally impossible that maybe there is a big shift in public opinion against Trump and the party turns against him. That could happen. But, you know, in terms of predictions, you know, I've got nothing better than the conventional wisdom on that one. On the other hand, in the UK... Brexit continues to be stressfully high stakes from day to day to day. So um, just before I recorded this, there was an incredibly dramatic series of votes in Parliament in which, you know, I won't give the full summary, but the essential idea was Boris Johnson did get a new deal from the EU, which, to be honest, is something I didn't entirely see coming. And I don't think a lot of other commentators did. I mean, precisely because he got a deal that he'd already explicitly ruled out before. And I guess we should have just been aware that that level of hypocrisy was possible from him. And it was a bit naive to think that he'd be bound by his previous commitments on this. Um, I've been saying for a while now, this is a bit of an aside, that I thought Brexit would come down to remain versus no deal, and the sort of centrist options would fall away. That clearly hasn't happened, but I think the essential sort of um, underlying impetus behind my argument has stayed right, which is sort of like, it's going to come down to the two most extreme options. Now, what's happened, of course, is that Boris Johnson's deal, which is of a sort of very hard Brexit that has a bloody internal border within the UK, for God's sake, um, that's replaced no deal as the sort of totem of the hard Brexiteers. I think my overall thesis was right, that we're going to get down to something quite hard on the Brexit side and just not at all on the other side, and that the compromise solutions will fall away. I think that's been right, but I think what I got wrong is that the sort of hard one would be a no deal as opposed to a hard deal. But anyway, he's trying to get this through Parliament, and there's this incredibly complicated series of votes, where first he loses a vote on the order in which the votes will happen, then he wins a vote on essentially whether or not Parliament will debate the bill, but then he loses a vote on the timetable in which Parliament will debate it, meaning that there's no possibility. And, well, I mean, this is the reality from where I'm talking now. Who knows if you're listening to this a year from now what's going to have happened. But there's no real possibility of getting the deal through before the 31st deadline, which means that there's going to have to be an extension. It looks like the EU will grant that, although how long, we don't know. And then the question is going to be, with that extra time, do we does the government go for trying to ratify their deal again? Do they go for an election or maybe try and do both? From where I'm standing now, it looks like the government's going to try and do both, get it ratified and then go to election. But how that will all play out, I honestly don't know. And I think anyone who pretends they do is just being overconfident there. So that's, that's sort of the moment I'm talking to you from. And... You know, regardless of predictions and what's going to happen, what I was incredibly struck by with this series of votes is just how they were being covered and how it was happening was so totally different to how parliamentary votes usually happen in the UK. So when it came to this series of votes on Wednesday, when it really looked like, and let's be clear, if the government had won both of the votes on Wednesday, that in other words, they both opened debate and agreed to the timetable, that would probably have been game over for Remain. Like three years of me following this thing and covering this thing and reading about it and asking experts, and it could have all been over if a few votes had gone the other way. 
But the way it was is it wasn't a party line vote at all. Um, Johnson managed to get the loyalist Tories, the Tories he hasn't kicked out on board. But there was this other group of Tories, these sort of 20 what are now getting called independent Tories, who, you know, they went one way on one vote, another way on another. You saw this group of Labour rebels who were happy to vote to open debate, but not to the timetable. There was, you know, the DUP, who has been quite loyal to the Tories. This is a a Northern Irish fraction, by the way, that the government has been relying on for support, but no more. They broke with the Tories on these series of votes. You know, and then there was the question of what will the minor parties do? And for each one... You were having to sort of, like, I was trying to work out what was going to happen. And what I thought was fascinating was that I was looking at not what the parties were doing. I wasn't going, well, the SNP is going to vote this way, Labour's going to vote this way, and then adding up how many votes each party commands, which is how you'd normally think about British politics. I was looking at individuals. I was looking at, like... What's going on with these 19 Labour MPs who've said they'll vote to open debate? Will they also vote for this timetable? Turns out most of them didn't. Now, I don't want to get lost in this because I've made the effort to understand the parliamentary arithmetic. And once you do, you just get into this double bind of like, you think you're never going to understand it. And when you eventually wrap your head around it, it's like, my God, how can I explain it to anyone else? There's other podcasts out there to do that. But the point is, I was looking at this, and it just confirmed to me this theory that I've had for a very long time, and that seems so true in this moment. It might not be true a year from now, but I was looking at it thinking, I'm not watching a parliament anymore. I'm watching a congress. Now, what I don't mean there is that the institutional rules had necessarily changed. I mean that the culture had changed. What people expected from politicians, what they expected from themselves, how the narrative was being structured, was much more akin to American politics. This whole, like, oh, how's so-and-so going to vote? This this member-by-member lobbying, where certain members will support some things, but not others, and you've got to, instead of just adding up the vote totals of parties, you've got to form a coalition of individuals. Well, that's totally alien to British politics, but it's quite usual for American politics, right? So, I've, I've set it up enough. This is my thesis, in simple terms. Regardless of the institutions that exist, there are two types of cultures that can exist within representative democracies. Congressional cultures and parliamentary ones. And by those words in this episode, I'm going to mean ways of thinking about politics. And what I'm going to argue is that those cultures come into being not as a downstream reflection of the institutions that a society has, but as a result of whether the identity divides in a country match up with partisan divides, or whether they overlap and cross-cut with partisan divides. Before we get to how these different cultures arise, though. Let me just try and explain my theory as to what they are. So again, I'm not looking at institutions, you know, as someone who's very interested in ideologies. I'm looking at the pair of glasses through which people perceive the political world. I'm looking at the framework through which they analyse it. And this framework may well be largely subconscious, not just for you know, voters looking at the system, but for politicians, for political observers and journalists and academics analysing it, there's some sort of baseline assumptions that they have that are going to impact how they see it. And so my theory has been for a long time that the sort of underlying assumptions that people bring to politics are different in the UK and the US. And I'm only going to look at those two countries. I'm not going to go to like European democracies or anything like that. And specifically, I think what I'm saying only applies to countries with representative but geographically divided 
legislators. So in other words, the country's carved up into regions, and each region elects a congressman or woman or a member of parliament. You don't do this thing that they do in some European countries, where it's just you just vote for a party and then seats are assigned on the basis of who gets the most votes. You do have a number of separate regions all electing a representative. I don't know how far what I'm talking about would apply to a system where you don't have that. So I'm thinking about specifically different ways you can think about it when you have a legislative body composed of members who all represent a different specific geographical chunk of the country. And I think there's been two ways of thinking about this, one of which historically is best represented by the British and one of which is represented by the Americans. So the congressional obviously has been the way the Americans have thought about it, and the parliamentary way of thinking about it has been how the British have thought about it historically. Because like I said, this has changed. So here's, here's what it comes down to. The difference between thinking about politics in a congressional way or a parliamentary way, at its heart, is the difference of how you conceive of what a political party is. To the congressional way of thinking, the party is primarily a collection of individuals who sort of have a common banner. In the parliamentary way of thinking about things, The party is a corporate entity that is discussed on its own terms and is discussed as having properties and desires and characteristics that exist of it as a corporate body. Now, of course, there's individuals within it, but that's not the most important thing about it. So consider, and I'm going to do something quite dangerous here and use a sports metaphor, because I don't know sports ball, but consider the difference between, say, football, either American or British, actually, but football and most Olympic track and field events. Most Olympic track and field events are competitions between individuals. You're there to cheer for Usain Bolt or whoever, right? And the people competing in them understand it as a competition between individuals. Now, that's not to say there's not teams like people are interested in and it matters whether like Team USA wins the most gold medals or whatever, right? But the, but the, sport, the spectators are there to cheer for an individual and primarily the competitors are there as individuals. So, by analogy, that's how people think about political actors within a congressional system. So, in other words, Americans, when they're asked who they vote for, historically at least, have tended to give you a name rather than a party. And people have tended to assess candidates as much on their individual record as on their party affiliation. And that People in Congress see themselves as actors in their own right, trying to... Congressmen always have their pet bill, right? They always have their thing they brag about. If you ask a congressman, you know, what have you accomplished? They say, I helped sponsor X bill. They don't say, or at least historically didn't, my party has done X things. Different to that, though, consider how you think about football. Football... You are there to cheer for a team, right? And not only that, but the individual players understand their success and failure in team terms, right? By and large, when people talk about football, they're like the Patriots or Manchester United. They had a really good season, right? The primary form of analysis is around the team conceived of as a corporate body. Now... Now, there are, of course, individual players within that team, and that matters to a degree, but the main thing isn't did an individual score a goal. The main thing is did the team win the match, and that's how you think about a party in a parliamentary system. You're generally there to vote for Labour, 
or to vote for the Tories, and this whole thing where individual politicians craft legislation and form coalitions to get it through, that simply doesn't happen. So if that's the main difference, what comes first, the individual actor or the political party? There's a number of other worldview assumptions, like I say, basic and often subconscious ways that we process political reality and interact with it that are going to flow out from that. So I quickly jotted down six of them. And I just want to run through this. And what I want you to notice is they do sort of form coherent worldviews of looking at the political. So in a congressional system, voters vote for a candidate first. In a parliamentary system, voters vote for the party first. Like in UK elections, until really quite recently, it really hasn't mattered at all, particularly the candidate who you're voting for. It's all about which party you want to win. Now, flowing from that, the next one is that will affect how politicians behave. So in a congressional system, politicians often break with their party, and indeed it's sort of expected that they do so. In a congressional system, that you don't have an overall majority doesn't necessarily mean that you can't legislate, because you can sort of incentivize some people on the other side to come over to yours. And conversely, that you have an overall majority doesn't mean... So think about the Republicans failing to pass the health care reform, um, the repeal of Obamacare. The fact that you have an overall majority in itself is no guarantee that you can legislate, because there might be some people with your, within your own party that break. And individual actors within a party have incentives that are quite different to the party and override them because they have to go back to their voters who will judge them as an individual rather than as a member of a party. They can't just defer to the party. They have to explain vote by vote why they voted. And so votes are gettable from the other side in a congressional way of thinking about it. That's the opposite in the parliamentary way of thinking about it. In the parliamentary way of thinking about it, politicians very rarely break with their party. And the incentives are the opposite. The incentives from a congressional point of view can often be very different to those of their party. In a parliamentary way of thinking, the incentives are almost always to stay loyal because the party itself will be much more powerful than the individual and the party will have mechanisms of enforcing that loyalty, either formal or informal, okay? So in the congressional system, elections are about candidates in the parliamentary, elections are about party platforms. So in other words, you know, in a congressional system, I am voting to send Mr. Smith to Washington because I believe he is an honest man who represents my values and will effectively pursue the right forms of political change. I'm not voting for him because he can on his own, pass a bunch of legislation. I'm voting for him because when particular bits of legislation come up, I trust him to vote in accordance with my values. In a parliamentary system, elections are about party platforms. I am voting for, for 10 points that I think should happen to the country, right? I'm voting for a party platform because it's not about individuals. I'm voting for this party, if it got a majority, promised to do X, Y, and Z. Because again, remember in a parliamentary way of thinking, what, what matters is you get an overall majority and then you legislate. And so that goes to the next point. In a congressional system, legislating is about forming a legislative coalition for a particular issue. In a parliamentary system, legislating is about gaining a majority for an agenda. So let me say that again. 
In a congressional system, legislation is passed bill by bill. Regardless of who has an overall numerical control, there may or may not be a majority for a particular issue. There's also an underlying assumption that in a congressional system, votes are gettable. Right. So think about like how legislation works in the West Wing or a lot of TV dramas about American politics is they don't say, OK, we won the election. Now we're going to do X. No, there's an existing state of play in Congress. They have a bill that they want to pass and then they've got to go out and find the votes for it. They've got to persuade people to get on board with it. And the legislative coalition that you mobilise for one particular issue may well not be there for, for another. And there's no assumption that because you can mobilise a legislative coalition around healthcare reform, that you'll be able to do the same on a carbon cap and trade, right? I pick the examples randomly. In a parliamentary system, the exact opposite assumption. Getting legislation passed is a matter of gaining a majority in an election. Because again, the assumption in a parliamentary system is that by and large, political actors will almost always vote with the party. So once you gain a majority, you have a democratic mandate to then go and implement whatever 10 steps you said you were going to implement. And the assumption would be that you'll be able to implement all of them because all of the people within your party will have been elected by voters who voted for them under the expectation that they would vote for that agenda and implement it. So then when it comes to how do you assess a party in power and form judgments on it, in a parliamentary system, you assess the party, not the individual. So in a parliamentary way of thinking about things, the governing party is held accountable for implementing the platform they said they were going to implement and how well it went. Right. So in other words, the party goes to the voters, put us in power, give us a majority and we'll do X, Y and Z. And then when they're in power and they have a majority, the voters look at them and they go, did they do X? Did they do Y? Did they do Z? Did it go well? Was it implemented? Was it done in a sort of competent and honest way? And to the extent that that, the answers to those questions will determine whether they get their votes again the next time. Right. So it's a much more direct way of thinking about political change. That's not how historically Americans have thought about how you get to political change. It's it's frankly a much more convoluted process in which candidates are held accountable for their individual voting record and their individual accomplishments. So when Americans are thinking about how to vote, they go, they don't go, did this candidate go and implement the platform that I sent them there to implement. They said, well, you know, we had like three or four big bills this session. Uh, We had the Kavanaugh hearing. You know, how did my senator vote on Kavanaugh? Because like, I didn't want them to pass that and uh, to appoint him, sorry. And oh, they voted against. Good. I like that. How did they vote on the tax cuts? I, I didn't want that to pass. Oh, good, they didn't. And, you know, has my you know senator or congressman done anything? Can they come back and say, I got 12 members to support this thing and I helped get it passed, right? So you're assessing them as an individual, right? That's basically the differences that I think flow from these two underlying worldview assumptions that exist for politicians, for political commentators, and the public alike. The final one that sort of comes out of this and that flows through all of it is that the congressional way of thinking about it is a regional way of thinking about it, and the parliamentary one is a national way of thinking about it. And so congressional systems kind of make sense for countries that are heavily regionally divided. Because in a congressional way of thinking about it, the candidate is going to make a specific pitch for a specific geographically defined set of voters. In more common sense terms, they're going to say, I'm the best person to represent this 
district. It's why American politicians often heavily sort of focus on and speaking in like the regional accent of where they're from, showing that they like and understand and participate within local culture. Now, parliamentary systems, by their nature, are national because people are voting for a national agenda, and they're not voting primarily for who's best for their region, they're voting for a set of policies that they want to see implemented for the country as a whole. So, just to sum up then, congressional culture, as opposed to congressional institutions, but congressional culture is a way of thinking, often a subconscious way of thinking about politics, in terms of how voters assess politicians, and in turn, how politicians think about what they're there to do, how they behave, and how they appeal to voters. So in congressional culture, the party is seen as a collection of individuals. Voters vote for candidates first before parties. Politicians, as a result, often break with their parties. Elections are about candidates. Legislating is about forming a legislative coalition issue by issue. Candidates are held accountable for how they voted issue by issue. And then they go back and make the case that their voting records and accomplishments were correct for the region. Parliamentary systems have point by point the opposite worldview assumptions. In contrast to seeing politics as individual actors with individual incentives, politics is viewed as the competition between corporate bodies. In other words, political parties. Voters vote for these parties first, and the politicians within them are strongly incentivized to remain loyal to the party. The expectation is that they don't break, and that parliamentary systems can usually count on their members' votes for anything that was within the um, manifesto that they went to the public on. Hence, legislating becomes uh, not about assembling a point-by-point majority for specific issues, but getting a getting a majority in a body in order to implement an agenda in general. Hence, again, the governing party is held accountable not on individual members' basis, but as a whole for if they implemented that agenda or not. And this is quite a national way of thinking, where people think about what they want for the country as a whole, not what's best for the district. Now, did you stay with me for all of that? I think those are two different ways of seeing the political world. And if you're saying, well, hang on, it seems like a lot of what you've just said actually isn't applying to the US and the UK right now. Right. That's exactly my point in that it's just changed. But historically, at least, if you think about the culture and mythology of Congress. If you, I mean, I talked about the West Wing, but if you look at almost any sort of dramatization or political novel about the operation of elections or power or whatever in the United States, it seems like the person creating that drama is thinking within a congression, maybe subconsciously, but thinking within a congressional framework, right? The West Wing definitely is, right? Conversely, if you look at works of fiction, drama, representations in popular culture of British politics, the reverse is true. It seems very clear, and again, maybe subconsciously, that the authors are thinking about that in terms of a parliamentary way of thinking about it. And one of the things that I found quite interesting is having lived in both countries, having followed closely the politics of both countries... I can kind of see it both ways. And the parliamentary way of doing things can seem very alien to the to the American mind, and vice versa. The congressional way of doing things just seems bizarre to British people, I think. Um, to my mind, I can sort of see the virtues of both. I think they both have, like, slightly different qualities. Um, and I think they both are coherent together right? Like all the points I just went through, if you have all of them, that's kind of a coherent whole. It's a way of looking at the world that makes sense with itself. It's internally coherent, 
They are different, but I'm not here to necessarily one is better than the other. I can actually, I find, sort of look at the world through both pairs of glasses and see something that makes sense. Overall, congressional is a way of thinking about politics that's kind of bottom-up. Right? The candidates come from the districts and they're there to represent the districts. Uh, parliamentary's top down. It's about governing agendas for the whole country. Um, congressional requires more engagement on the part of voters. You don't just have to assess a party every four years, you have to stay in touch with how your member voted issue by issue. And that can be tricky because it's like, we'll say, because the expectation in congressional cultures is that politicians will compromise. So say you're represented, voted for a bill you don't like, like let's say Bernie Sanders voted for the crime bill, which many people now regard as part of what went wrong with the criminal justice system. Well, does that mean we shouldn't like him? Well, his defenders will say, oh, but he only voted for it to get the violence against women protections through. I'm not going to go into if I think that debate is right or wrong, but the point is you have to do a really careful analysis of someone's voting record to find a judgment on them. It's quite a demanding way of doing politics. It's also a way of doing politics that's much higher drama, because you don't know in advance whether a particular bill will pass or not, and you have to look at the motivations of individuals. It's a way of looking at the world that's going to engage a narrative storyteller much more. On the converse, the parliamentary system has the virtue of simplicity. You decide which agenda you like, You vote for it, and then you hold them accountable in four years to whether they implemented it. In theory, with a parliamentary system, you know, the voter engagement is sort of more like a check-in rather than in the congressional system, where it's a more sort of continual, you know, process where it's something you're just always doing. Now, you can debate which of those is better, right? Like, maybe high engagement is better, maybe low engagement is better. Another one which I just mentioned is congressional tends to be geared towards compromise, right? If every individual, if you are going to have to assemble a legislative coalition for every bit of legislation that's to be passed, the expectation is that individual votes are gettable, that you can go out and you can persuade individual members, or, and what's always been an open secret within congressional systems that is accepted and tolerated, that you can bribe individual members to come over to your side. People talk about pork barrel spending or money in politics. It is understood that in order for a congressional system to work, people are going to have to be forced to positions of compromise. And it's always been understood that a certain degree of corruption, either legal or illegal, is necessary in order to force that compromise. That's always been a part of American political mythology and how it works. Parliamentary systems, on the other hand, are much more geared towards decisive change, decisive moments. So the British general electorate goes to the polls in 1945 and gets straightforwardly to choose between socialism and no socialism. They vote for socialism, they get socialism, they get the NHS, they get privatised railways, they get a welfare state, and it's just implemented. That could never happen in America. Which makes, like, an American look at that and go, there is no single election that we could have that would allow us to just implement Bernie Sanders' agenda, right? You'd have to win and maintain legislative supermajorities for decades, right? Whereas one election does it in the UK. So Americans might look at that and go, well, actually, I kind of like that. Now, the converse is, if the opportunities are greater then the perils are greater too. Thatcherism was much more extreme and much more radical and much more violent than Reaganism in its own way. Reagan had greater constraints operating on him, and you shudder to think what Trump would have done with a legislative majority in the UK system, where there are simply no checks in the way that there are in the American system. So, the way an old um, 
comparative government is what we used to call it, is the American system is like a super tanker. If you want to change, you know, it's like this huge process of turning the boat around. The British system, and the British way of thinking about it, is more like a speedboat. You can nip around and change direction very quickly, but because of that, you're also much more liable to, like, crash into something, right? So that's maybe a dumb metaphor, but, like, that's how I sort of think about it. Um, but both of these systems don't just, both of these ways of thinking about it don't exist independently. They also sort of require a system that's designed around them, right? How is politics held in check? So in America, the way we think about it is politics is held in check by structures, right? Right? Because there is no overall party agenda, if our representatives start doing things we don't like, well, legislation has to pass multiple hurdles, it has to, you know, go before the Supreme Court. There's all sorts of structures that are explicitly designed to constrain the operation of political. The UK system's completely different. Like, we don't have judicial review. Parliament could, by simple majority, overturn the Bill of Rights one day and the the Magna Carta the next, which seems terrifying to an American. But in our way of thinking about it, politicians are held in check by elections. If they do something you don't like, vote them out. And it's much easier to vote them out because you're not having to go through and assess individual by individual who should be there. You're just giving control back to the other party. So those that, that is the two ways of thinking about it and sort of what their implications are. And I think sort of like what their advantages and disadvantages are. And I actually don't necessarily see one as being better than the other. I think these are two ways of thinking about politics that are internally coherent. And I actually quite like both of them. I actually quite like sometimes putting my congressional glasses on and getting really into the drama of how individual actors will vote and so on. And I sometimes quite like putting my parliamentary glasses on and thinking, well, this is what I want as an agenda for the country as a whole. Now, here's my essential thesis. It's that in recent years, they flipped. In the Americans, both American voters, American political commentators, and American politicians, because it's an interaction between all three, right, have changed their underlying political culture, their underlying worldview assumptions. And they've stopped thinking about politics in congressional terms, and they've started thinking about politics in parliamentary terms. At the same time, the UK has also flipped, and this is why I started with this Byzantine process of ratifying the Brexit bill. Just look at that. The way that parliament was behaving, which culture... Which way of seeing the world would you say they were operating within? It was congressional, right? So why has this happened? Now, I think the standard response is that if you have a system like the US, which has a lot of checks and balances, which has judicial oversight, and which is geared towards compromise a congressional culture or a congressional way of seeing things will come as a result of that. If you have a system like the UK, which is clearly very geared towards there simply being a governing majority, then a parliamentary culture will arise. But to think of culture as simply just being downstream from institutions doesn't work here because it seems to me like both countries have switched their cultures. It's an inversion, right? It's the exact opposite thing has happened in both countries. The US has gone from seeing seeing its politics from a congressional to a parliamentary way. The UK has done the opposite and their institutions haven't changed. So it's something else. And here's what I think it is. People have fundamental identities, the most important things about how they define themselves and how they define what they believe in moral terms. If those identities match up with their partisan expression, then you'll get a parliamentary culture arising. If, however, those fundamental identities sort of overlap and cross-cut with the partisan expression, you'll get 
um, a congressional culture. So let's look at this and let me make the case that they have changed and why they've changed. So historically, America's been, let's just take it from, say, like maybe around the time of the Second World War, congressional culture. You see very high levels of politicians breaking with their parties and quite strong regional contingents, right? Like you have Southern Democrats, right? are a distinct thing. And clearly when it comes to like Southern Democrats, their motivations are very different than the motivations as the party as a whole. And it's clear voters are assessing them more as individuals than they are as overall bodies. And you have like Northern liberal Republicans and so on and so forth. Now what happens from the beginning of like the Civil Rights Act and a lot of the changes that make America a more racially integrated society is the fundamental identities don't quite match up with partisan affiliations. So, in other words, if your fundamental identity is as a white Southerner, which is a very, very powerful and cohesive identity group with specific beliefs attached to it, and then through most of the latter half of the 20th century, that identity has been competed over by both Republicans and Democrats, the so-called Southern strategy, right, where Republicans try and peel these votes away from Southern Democrats. But it's not a one-shot thing. There's various attempts, like Jimmy Carter, a Southerner with a Southern accent, does really well in Southern states with that demographic. Bill Clinton, you know... Um, does some liberal stuff, but also appeals to Southerners, also overtly appeals to white fears about black people. And although it's clear by that point he's still, you know, he's fighting a losing battle, he still does okay. You know, he picks up some Southern states. So in other words, the fundamental identity doesn't have a neat alignment with the partisan identity. And what that means is politicians kind of have to hedge their bets right? And that gives you a congressional culture. Now, what's changed in America is it's finally consolidated. And I think this really only happened in the early 2000s, where a lot of these white Southerners sort of finally gave up defining themselves as conservative Democrats and just shifted over into the Republican Party. And conversely, you know, affluent, college-educated Northerners who would have been happy enough to sort of vote for, like, a New England Republican type, they were eventually driven out of the Republican Party and simply became moderate Democrats. So you got, you know, over 30, 40, 50 years, this realignment in which the fundamental identities matched their partisan expression. And the fundamental identity in America is attitudes towards race. That is our most important, what political scientists call social cleavage. That is our primary divide in terms of in-group and out-group, how we see each other and what we believe. And that was something that cut against parties. And increasingly over the past couple of decades, it's not. And you've seen voters, politicians, and, Congress and um, political observers move away from, in that same period, thinking about politics in congressional terms, in terms of a congressional mode of analysis, glasses to put on, and start thinking about it in parliamentary terms. So I date this all the way back to Newt Gingrich's contract with America. So if you don't remember this, this is where the Republicans got the House majority under Bill Clinton. And the way they did it, and this was quite new for American politics, is they went and said, if you electors, here is the 10, I think it was 10, it might have been like low teens, but here is the set of things in which we will do if you give us a congressional majority. Well, everyone just sort of was like, okay, that was a new tactic, but that is profoundly, that is a parliamentary move, right? That is a way of operating within politics and talking about politics that's parliamentary. That's not how congressional ways of thinking about the world would imply. That presenting a national agenda is distinctively um that's distinctively parliamentary. Now, you fast forward a little bit to the Obama years, and at the beginning of Obama's term, Republican leaders said in advance to him, we are not going to give you votes. Not a single vote 
for any of your signature policy issues. And they explicitly told him publicly when the Obamacare thing came around, you will not get a single Republican vote for this, and they didn't. That is a parliamentary way of operating in politics. Because within a congressional way of thinking about things, you know, the individual has incentives that the party doesn't. So even if the party says we're opposed to this, they simply don't have the power over their members in order to ensure that none of them break. They just don't. That ability to say, I am making a decision for my party en masse, that is a parliamentary way of looking at things. And if you look at the current um, Trump era, you see the same. There seems to be structures in place that just directly align the individual's incentives with those of the party. Now, in the UK, historically, those structures have always been formal. In other words, there is a mechanism, like you, we call it withdrawing the whip, but we need to get into that, in which you know, particular members can be expelled from the party and their political career ended for being disloyal. Happened recently in the UK. It seems clear to me that whenever a Republican now starts criticising Trump or breaks with Trump, he has to leave the party and not run for re-election. Now, the mechanisms aren't formal, but it's clear that they're there. It's clear that some combination of primary pressure, of where the big donors are, of how Fox News communicates, of the media environment that we're in, some combination of all of that is having the same disciplining effect on their members that structures would in a parliamentary system, and this goes to something I've always said, which are structures are just codifications of the underlying operation of power. But it seems like the Republicans are now overtly behaving like a parliamentary party. They're thinking about it that way, their voters are thinking about it that way, and that's just the culture and the framework in which they're operating. And I think Democrats took longer to get there. I think... If you look at the Bush years and the Obama years, Democrats were still clearly thinking about this in a congressional way of thinking. But they, they, they were getting steamrolled because of it. Because if one party can act as a corporate entity and another can't, then the one that can't is always just going to get decimated because they can be split apart and their opponents can't. So I think increasingly in recent years, years, you've seen a reluctant shift of culture among Democrats in which they're now increasingly thinking of themselves as a corporate party, as a corporate entity. And if you look at how they've come together on impeachment, the mechanisms through which that sort of unity was achieved were much more out in the open than they have been for Republican unity. But nonetheless, once it reached a critical mass, they acted more or less in unison, right? And again, if you look at how we're assessing candidates for the 2020 Democratic primary, we're assessing them on the basis of their party platforms. They all have to come out with these, like, 10-point plans, and then we go, well, you know, I like Bernie Sanders because I agree with the Medicare for All bit, I agree with this bit, I agree with that bit, and, you know... Uh, Elizabeth Warren in her plan on X issue, as if any of them are going to be able to legislate. None of these people are going to be able to legislate, by the way. Um, but you can get... I, so I've gone from being frustrated about that. Like, these people at best are going to be able to pass one big thing, and even that is dubious if we don't retake the Senate, right? Because, again, Republicans are behaving as a parliamentary party, right? This thing where we can break off individual members through protest and pressure and whatever, that day is dead. And it's not coming back. We're within a parliamentary way of thinking about it now. But then also, that thing where you say this is our national agenda, that's very parliamentary too. So America has flipped it's now, I think, primarily thinking about politics in a parliamentary way. The UK is the opposite. The UK until... This was much, much more recent in the UK. It hasn't been this gradual thing over decades. The UK was generally, until quite recently, a parliamentary culture. 
you know, we needed a change from the Thatcher and Major years. We voted in a Labour government on the promise of a sort of centre, centre-left agenda with specific points. They came in, they implemented the points, people by and large quite liked them, and they got re-elected a few times. Right? That's just pure parliamentary. They then did, did, did some stuff that people didn't like, like the Iraq war cost them votes, there was just a general fatigue, it seemed like the government was running out of steam, Gordon Brown wasn't managing it as competently as Tony Blair has, maybe, and this dude David Cameron comes along and says, I'm, you know, a lot of the stuff that you like about New Labour, I'm going to keep. And here's sort of like a centre-right agenda for the country. And people sort of looked at that and went, yeah, you know, it's time for a change, and we sort of like what David Cameron's proposing. And he governed, well, I mean, he had to because he was in alliance with the Liberal Democrats, but he governed in a way that sort of the centre, if the country was fine with, you know, he did, he implemented more or less the platform he promised. And he, narrowly, but he got re-elected because of it, right? So this is all just pure parliamentary. We're judging people by their parties. We're voting those parties in and out of power based on national agendas, not individuals. Pure parliamentary. And the reason for that is the fundamental identities which in the UK revolve around attitudes towards class, they're matched up with their partisan expression. Right Now, what happened is an entirely new set of fundamental identities was created by the Brexit referendum, in that issues which had not been that important historically suddenly galvanised people, and we suddenly had issues of competing nationalisms, which had never been the main ways British people define themselves, become incredibly important. Are, do you want Britain to be part of Europe, or do you not? Do you want Scotland? to be independent, stuff like that. And what happened is, you know, those sorts of, and this is in the data, if you ask people, what's your party preference, they'll have it. And if you ask them, are you a um, Remainer or a Lever, they'll have it. But if you ask them, what's more important to you, they'll always say, or like 75% of people will say, it's m me being, me wanting to remain in the EU is more important to me than my partisan expression. And that sort of divide is very new in British politics. It's a bit like, for a long time in American politics, that you were a white American Southerner with certain views about race was more important to you than who you would vote for, Republican or Democrat, and you would change that depending on who best catered towards your preference. Now, America's moved away from that and the UK's moved into it, in that you now have the Conservatives who two-thirds of their members voted to leave, but a third voted remain. How do you make sense of that? And Labour and some of the minor parties, most of their voters voted remain, but some voted leave. And so you now have these politicians with these very conflicting and specific motivations that are now suddenly all out of sync with their party's motivations. Like the motivation of a Labour MP in a seat that voted leave is very different to the motivation of one in a seat that voted to remain. And so now the UK has developed, is, is just starting to, and I think we just saw this with this last series of votes that I started on, where we're assessing individuals, where it's become this grand, complicated narrative about specific pieces of legislation, where there'll be the votes to start debate, but not for the timetable. There'll be the votes for a customs union, maybe, but not another type of thing. And you've really got to go through point by point, looking at individuals and assembling agendas around that. Now, if they've switched in terms of cultures, the problem with this, and I think this is my thesis for why British and American politics seem so bonkers right now, is that the institutions haven't changed. So in America, you have people thinking about politics and political actors acting in such a way as the underlying assumptions are parliamentary. We have a parliamentary political culture operating within institutions that are designed for a congressional culture. And in the UK, it's the converse. We now have a congressional political culture 
operating within institutions that are designed for a parliamentary one. And the result is sort of discombobulation and kind of a degree of panic. And it's unnerving. And it's not unnerving this story about like, you know, oh, it's just right wing populism and it's sort of the same thing. It's absolutely not. The, um, what's happened in the UK, in the US, is that a fundamental identity that's always existed has realigned. What's happened in the UK is that a fundamental set of identities have come into existence. It's very different. And this is what I meant when I said it's the mirror image. In the US, you have institutions that were designed for a congressional culture and had a congressional culture have that culture flip to a parliamentary one. In the UK, it's the exact mirror image. In the UK, you have institutions that are designed for a parliamentary culture, and until a few years ago, had a parliamentary culture flip to a congressional culture. So in other words, British and American politics right now aren't a study in similarities. They're a study in inversion. So in the US, there's a lot of the aspects of our institutions that just do not vibe with a parliamentary culture. And that's where you're seeing this stress in our system right now. So one of them I mentioned earlier is veto players. This is what comparative government people call, how many people are there in the system who can say no? And in the US, there's a shit ton of them, right? It's like it's got to pass the Congress, it's got to pass the Senate, the President's got to sign it, it's got to survive judicial review, you know, we'll the states implement it without too much fuss. And the problem now is voters expect parties to implement agendas. That's a key feature of thinking about this in parliamentary terms, is you vote for someone, they do the thing, and then you assess them on doing the thing. But the problem is, you know, in the UK, you can give people a control of a legislative body and they can do stuff. There's not really veto players in the UK. In the US, there are. And there was this stupid bl bloody thing Buta Buttigieg, Mayor Pete, said in the last debate where he was like, this is why people get so frustrated with Democrats. We say we're going to do these things and then we just don't. And it's like, dude... It's not because Democrats aren't voting for these things that they're not happening. It's because if the Republicans control even one veto player in a system that's nothing but veto players, they can block it. And vice versa for Democrats with Republicans, actually. But then there's this expectation, this parliamentary expectation, that if we vote a party into office with a particular agenda, that then we're going to assess them by whether or not they implement the agenda, which they almost never are able to because of all these veto players. So what that means is people are frustrated and there's this constant refrain of like, just get it done. We voted for you to do this. Go do it. Well, that is a parliamentary way of assessing a political party. And the result is you get this oscillating control of waves of frustration. If we elect a democratic president to do stuff, they're not able to do it. And then we empower a Republican Congress to go do something else. They can't do it. So then we vote the Democratic president back in. They can't do what they promised to do. So then we vote a Republican president back in, and they can't promise. They can't do what they promised to do. So then we vote a Democratic Congress back in, and so on and so forth, because we're electing politicians and assessing their records in a parliamentary way, in a system that's not explicitly not set up to allow them to deliver those results. The other thing that's becoming very, very apparent and very, very painful is the regional structure of US governance. So, you know, in, in the past we had the Senate, and that sort of made sense where people, you know, every state gets the same number of senators. That sort of made sense when those senators were there explicitly to defend the interests of their state 
and would regularly break with their party. Now that the Senate has become consolidated, everything's partisan, it's very rare for Democrats to be able to pick up deep red seats and vice versa. There's still a few exceptions, like Joe Manchin and so on, but they, they're clearly a dying breed. Now, clearly the new norm is voting for a national party with a national agenda. And the problem is this regional structure, once you start thinking about it in parliamentary terms, allows one party to consolidate minority rule with a very small percentage of the population. I think the statistic is um, something like 7.5% of the population could elect half the Senate. We're not there yet, but that seems to be what the, the Republicans are going for. And what that does is it just allows there to be an almost permanent veto player within the system that doesn't allow, you know, you're supposed to be able to, a national majority in a parliamentary system is supposed to be able to turf a national party out of power when they're no longer happy with them. And because of, like, the sort of staged elections where only one third are up every two years, because of this heavily regional structure within the Senate, that's no longer possible. If we assemble 55% of the country who want Republicans to sort of not be in power for a bit and allow Democrats to legislate, that 55% or even 60% won't translate into the practical ability to do it. So again, you have a congressional culture running up against the constraints of a set of institutions designed for a congressional one. People, are, in other words, are voting for national interests through a regional system. And so the whole thing just doesn't work. And I think one of the ways you can view what's going on in the Democratic Party is there's a left wing and a centrist wing, right? There's um, Sanders and Warren and AOC versus like Biden and Klobuchar and so on, right? That's one way. That's definitely a way you can separate it out. Another way is just age. And I think this is going to play into it like an older generation of lawmakers against a younger one. I think another way is, yes, age, but age because of culture. People like Joe Biden grew up within, and I think clearly still think about politics in a congressional way. People like AOC, who are newer to politics, it's clear she thinks about politics in a parliamentary way. She goes after the Republican party rather than individuals. It's very clear to me that Biden sees it as a collection of individuals. And so what needs to happen here? I think what needs to happen is essentially, you know, if we're thinking about this in parliamentary terms, then we all need to be thinking about it in parliamentary terms. And so I don't want someone in charge of the party who clearly thinks about it in congressional terms. I don't think. But you also see this with impeachment, in that there's this thing about how do we separate Trump from the party? How do we get Republicans to turn on him? That's a holdover. That's a congressional way of thinking about politics as individuals. That the way we're thinking about it now has moved beyond. And I think if I'm trying to provide one piece of strategic to ad advice to e the UK and the US, it would be in the case of the US, you hold the party accountable, not the individual. That doesn't mean we give Trump a pass on everything that he's done and all of the corruption and all of the crimes. It means we talk about Republican corruption, Republican crimes as opposed to Trump's. Don't make it this individual thing. Don't make it, well, Senator so-and-so is refusing to hold Trump into account. That's a framing that um, centers it on individuals, which is no longer about how Americans are thinking about their politics. They're thinking about it in terms of parties, right? Um, say, when Republicans are in power, they use that power for corruption they refuse to root it out in their own party for undermining our elections. Let's start talking about the corrupt Republican Party rather than the corrupt presidency. And that's how, historically at least, executive abuse has been held in check in the UK. You go after the party, 
Now, that doesn't mean that you might not eventually get an impeachment, because in the UK, parties will ditch their leader if they become a liability, but a liability to the party. Remember, in parliamentary systems, parties are primarily collective corporate entities. They're not collections of individuals. So stop trying to find this way of driving a wedge between Trump and Republicans as individual actors. In your messaging, in your attack, go after the party. And then the party, as a corporate entity, may well... You know, might, theoretically, make a decision to restructure itself. But primarily, the way you hold people accountable in parliamentary systems is through elections. We are making the case that the Republican Party cannot be trusted with governance, that it is corrupt, that it conspires with foreign powers, and it needs to be taken away from any position of power in American society. And I think that case has the virtue of being true. I don't necessarily differentiate between like Senate Republicans and the presidency in the same in the way I think a lot of people want to. We need to view them as part of the same thing. I think that's that's like the the, the shift that we need to make on the left. What about in the UK? Well, in the UK, like I say, it's mirror image. You have the exact opposite problem. You have a congressional culture that's arisen trying to express itself through a parliamentary system. So the whole system in the UK is designed around the assumption that the executive, the prime minister, can command the support of the legislative parliament. Now, in the U- U- US, it's quite common that the president and the Congress are of opposing parties. The whole of the UK is set up around the uh, uh, assumption that that can't happen. The prime ministers lose big votes is very, very rare. We've probably had as many in the last year as we have in the last hundred years in the UK, to put it into context. And the expectation is that when they no longer can, we go to election. But that's also proved difficult as well. The the mechanism for finding compromise are just not there because there's no veto players in the UK. In the US, there's like a bazillion veto players. And the idea is all of those points of veto will force you to compromise, that you'll be in a position where you sort of have to give a bit of ground. That's not there. In the UK, remember, the UK is a speedboat. So you've got this congressional... You know, the idea of the UK is it's a speedboat, yes. But that speedboat will be captained by someone who has... You know, an individual entity who has a coherent plan. Now the speedboat is being captained by a Congress who can't make up their mind and have different opinions about different things. It's crazy. You also, finally, remember I said there's a sort of regional national distinction? Now British politics is very, very regional. It's all about, like, what are Scotland's interests in Brexit? What's London's are very different from the surrounding south of England. The industrial north is very different through a system that's designed for national governance. And there's no mechanism in place for individual regions to have their say. So I just said, I'm increasingly feeling like the US Senate just doesn't make any sense anymore in the American system. We don't need another veto player. And this heavily regional structure doesn't make sense when people are electing national parties. The parties are behaving as national parties, and we're assessing them as national parties. It just doesn't make sense. In the UK right now, a Senate constituted along American lines, where each country within the UK, you know, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England, each gets to have, you know, a set number. Say every country in the UK gets 10 people. And, you know, those could be elected or however you want, right? But they would come with specifically intent of representing Scotland's interests, say. Having an upper chamber with that composition in the UK would make a heck of a lot of sense right now, because it would act on a check on someone in Parliament being able to cobble together a majority for an outcome that only represents one particular tribe or, like, set of countries. It would act as a check on that, and it would ensure that whatever emerged was something that broadly, you know, 
was more common ground that more people could live with. So, in other words, the, 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 the thing in the UK is the exact opposite. People are voting based on very regional interests into a system that's designed to deliver national outcomes. So you go through it point by point by point, and it's the inverse. It's the exact inverse what's happening in the UK and the US right now. And if I had one big lesson for the um, American left, based on how I've seen the British left behave within a parliamentary system. Here's my lesson for the British left trying to operate within a constitutional framework. Cut some deals. Like I said at the beginning, a bit of out-and-out corruption has necessarily been what's been needed to get the gears turning. That's the sort of oil that's lubricated the engine and allowed American congressional structures to work. You know... If Tory MPs are breaking with their party, let's make a deal where if we can get their votes on these series of things, they get to keep their seat. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll withdraw the opposition candidates running against them. Let, and that, that is anathema to how like the Labour Party wants to think about it. The Labour Party wants to do what Clement Attlee did in 1945, which is what I just talked about, which is get a majority for socialism and do socialism. And it's clear from how they think and how they talk about this that they're still really struggling to let go of that. But we're no longer in that world. That's not how people are thinking about it. We're thinking about it in regional, individualistic, congressional terms. And so now you've got to start behaving as if you're in a congressional system, which is so weird. So whenever I do analysis, people want to ask, how do we get back to normalcy? Because this, this is bonkers right now, right? Well, if the culture doesn't match the system, then there's one of two things that can change. Either the culture can change or the system can change. And I think in both countries, you see within both the left and the right, I'll just take the left, a sort of debate about which one it has to be. So in a lot of ways, Joe Biden's candidacy is about it's the culture that has to change, right? It's the culture that has to go back. We have to go back to my friends across the aisle. He always says this, they're, not the, my, they're my opponents, not my enemies, and we can get stuff done by working together. And he's not a fan of any of the sort of structural reforms that are being floated. So the culture goes back and America becomes just straight congressional. That's the Biden pitch. That seems really, really hard to me because I don't think it can be done unilaterally. I don't think... I think all that would be would be the Democratic Party going back to that way of things, but the Republicans wouldn't, and it would just be the Obama presidency 2.0. And if Obama led to Trump, then Obama 2.0, I think, will lead to Trump 2.0. So I'm very sceptical of that way of approaching it. On the other hand, there's the Elizabeth Warren thing, where her first point of order isn't healthcare reform, it's... um structural change. We're going to get rid of the filibuster, we're going to do anti-corruption, we'll pack the court if need be. In other words, we will sort of level out our democracy such that add more states, you know, Puerto Rico and DC, such that the, the parliamentary culture that we've adopted now starts to make more sense. Now, one of the reasons, I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, that I'm slightly sceptical of Sanders is sometimes he sounds like someone who's taking that point of view, and sometimes he sounds like someone who's still stuck within the congressional way of thinking, because it's like he gets asked, how will you achieve Medicare for all? And he says, you know, it's not just going to be politics, we're going to have to have protests, activism, movements. Now, if what you're envisaging is winning a decimating election in which we have a huge majority in Congress and in which, you know, the Senate goes like 60-40 to Democrats and that's made possible by activism, cool. I'm dubious as to how likely that is, but that's a coherent political strategy. If the, but I think what he means is this use the bully pulpit, put pressure on individual Republicans, you know, really take the heat to them, have protests, and, you know, we'll peel off a few votes and we'll get Medicare for all through that way. 
that is that is not a political strategy I think is going to work because the Republican Party is behaving as a parliamentary party where you can no longer incentivize individuals to act separately from the corporate entity of which they're a part. Now, on the other hand, sometimes Bernie Sanders says things that sound a bit more parliamentary, but a big part of why I like Warren is that her approach seems to be not that we're going to legislate within the system by doing sort of congressional stuff, but more and more aggressively, and we're going to lobby individual members with a lot of protest and so on. But no, we have to change the system. Now, if I'm being fair, if I said I don't see us changing the culture, if I'm being fair, I also don't see us changing the system. I think there's not the appetite right now amongst most democratic lawmakers to do the really radical structural changes that would allow us to behave more like a parliamentary system. Even stuff like getting rid of the filibuster, for fuck's sake, is contentious. And what they say doesn't make sense. The reason for not getting rid of the filibuster is, oh, but like, you know, that means when Republicans are in charge, they'll be able to override it too. Number one, Republicans work around the filibuster when they're in charge anyway. We're the only ones who allow ourselves to be bought, to be constrained by that. But number two, that's the point. The point of a parliamentary system is that you have oscillating control, in that there aren't these checks anymore. That, that, that people are, that, that, that political parties, not individuals, are held accountable by elections, not structures, right? The whole point of getting rid of the filibuster, and frankly, I think the fucking Senate should go, but, like, that's more radical. But, like, the point of getting rid of all of these veto players is that people of both parties will be able to legislate. That's the whole point. And that, yes, there'll be periods where Republicans can come in and govern without the sorts of constraints that they have. But then people will be able to see the results of that governance, assess them and turf them out. One of the reasons the Republican Party has been able to become so radical, particularly on economics, is they're always partially constrained. People aren't able to see what these ideas really look like. And like, if you don't like that, then you, you, you're, then your other option is Joe Biden. Your other option is to go back to a congressional culture. And I think there's a sort of on the hardcore socialist left, there's a sort of schizophrenia of not knowing what it wants. Does it want a congressional culture, but like more so, where we can really lobby individual members and do like protest and whatever and change the political culture and use the bully pulpit? Or does it want structural change in which we start behaving more like a parliamentary system in which we elect parties and assess parties. And part of the deal of a parliamentary system is that if you get in, you can do your agenda. But if your opponents get in, so can you. And like, you can argue it both ways, which is better, but that is sort of the choice. In the UK, conversely, do we change our institutions to match a con congressional culture? Or does our culture go back to being a parliamentary one? Well, on the one hand, say Brexit gets resolved. It hasn't at the time of recording, but, you know, it, it, who knows, right, where that's going. And then maybe these sorts of more fundamental divides go away. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. But I'm really dubious of that. Because I think, say it's revoked, there's going to be a big tribe of, like, leavers who are angry and feel betrayed and are still going to keep voting to leave as part of their political identity. Say we do do a quite hard Brexit, then I don't think the Remainer sentiment is suddenly going to dissipate. Which is why my preferred outcome has always been a very soft Norway-style Brexit, but I think that's clearly not happening at this point. So I don't see those fundamental divides going away, and I don't see the strongly regional nature of British politics, which has reasserted itself in recent years, I don't see that going away anytime soon either. So then, do we change our structures? Well, again, you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, in that our structures are just not set up to handle this, in that 
if we what we need is more veto players and more institutions designed to create compromise, what politician in their right mind is going to start creating institutions with the explicit purpose of constraining themselves? I don't see that either. So in America, I have a preference for like, you know, if we're thinking about politics in parliamentary terms, then let's realign our structures to that. Because I honestly... I don't see this sort of two... America has devolved from multiple cross-cutting, you know, different identities and to two teams. There are two teams now where your fundamental identity is your partisan one. I think that's going to be the reality for the foreseeable future. And so if it is just two, two teams, then we just have normal democratic alternation where we vote for national agendas and they implement them. That's sort of my preferred option in America, but I don't see it happening, actually, quite frankly. I see Americans voting for people on parliamentary assumptions into a system that isn't capable of delivering them, and then getting increasingly angry and frustrated about it. And so this escalation of anger at politics and distrust at politicians, I see only elevating in the UK, in the US, and I see it only elevating in the UK for the same reasons, in that our expectations in both countries, in a mirror image sort of way, are not what our institutional structures are set up to deliver. So in terms of what I'd like to see happen, my bias is towards changing the institutions around the culture rather than the other way round. Because, well, to quote Karl Marx, he says, talking about God and religion and money, he says, the creators have bowed down before their creations. The phantoms of their mind have gotten out of their hands. In other words, institutions are things that we make and things we can change. And, you know, in a Burkean sense, we should be careful about doing so and we shouldn't just tear up the whole social contract. But, like, we should design our institutions based on what works for us, not the other way round. So that's my bias. But my prediction is that both of them are such an uphill climb that I don't think we'll get to either. I don't think we'll get to structural change in either the UK or the US, and I don't think we'll get to cultural change. And one of my things that I've started, I'll put it more neutrally than I was going to, one of the ways I've started thinking about politics is what is political analysis? What is it that I've just done? Well, I've told a story. I've tried to bring together a certain set of events and facts and attitudes and behaviours into a sort of coherent narrative that makes sense in its own terms, right? Now, people always ask, but then how do we get back to X? Where X can be a socialist utopia, it can be this idea of unity, it can be that there'll be no more division, or it can just be that politics isn't so fucking bonkers as it is now in both countries. How do we get, how do we get out of that? And... Here's the thing, if you think about political analysis just as creating a story, the best story, the one that explains in the most intuitive and coherent way the data that you're trying to explain, might not have that sort of happy ending. There's no guarantee that it will. The universe isn't set up such that it will, and human society isn't set up such that it will. So this analysis that I've given you I can tell you like what I think ought to happen within it, and even that I'm not really sure. But in terms of what will happen, I think we're going to be left in both countries for the foreseeable future with a fundamentally schizophrenic politics, where our attitudes and behaviours and the categories and concepts we bring to politics, the incentives that are created both for politicians and voters because of those attitudes and behaviours, are going to be fundamentally out of sync with how our institutions were set up and what they were designed to deliver. And a lot of the stuff that people are like, this is an aberration and will return to normal, I increasingly am feeling might just be the shape of things to come. Now, who knows? I could be wrong. Hope to be wrong, in fact. You know, you might be listening to this a few years from now, and it's like, well, Christ, everything just suddenly worked out in the UK, right? 
But I don't see the culture changing in either country. I don't. These fundamental identities, whether it is you believe Britain should be independent or not, or a sense of sort of white southern identity or a sense of racial solidarity with other groups, these run very, very deep. Very deep. I don't see people just walking away from them or expressing their political preferences outside of them. I also don't see right now the political will in either country to change the institutions. And so I think the current state of play is going to be the state of play for the foreseeable future. And I know that's not a very optimistic outlook, but again, there's no guarantee that political analysis will give you an optimistic outlook. And there's no guarantee that it'll give you a clear-cut strategy of getting to one. I actually think it's largely inescapable that our politics is going to be as angry and as incoherent as it has been. I think this is the new normal. And I hope very much to be wrong, but I think it is. (laughs) 